I think for me, the, the bottom line, Michael, I've always believed that if we know where to look and how to look into the past, the wisdom of our ancestors and our most ancient and cherished spiritual uh, traditions, we would find the clues that would help us to transcend the hate that has led to the war and the suffering that we've seen certainly in our lifetimes in the 20th and now the 21st century. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Riches, blessings to all of you, and welcome to Take Back Your Mind, a podcast that is about doing exactly that, taking back our mind. Our mind is to be an instrument for expanded awareness, not just a, a being programmed into fear, doubt, and worry, but actually as a tool for us to see that which is real and that which is eternal and forever, the beauty and the love the wholeness that's everywhere. Welcome to Take Back Your Mind. I am your host, Michael B. Beckwith. Now, the life question of the week is from Charmaine. Charmaine asks, I have a question about jealousy in my boyfriend. I get jealous and insecure around other women and tell myself stories that lead me to believe that my boyfriend would rather be with someone else and that I'm not good enough. My boyfriend has done nothing directly to, to me to create this belief, but I've always been this way towards partners, and it gets so overbearing sometimes that I catch myself being controlling, and I don't like the person I have become. How can I release this? You said some very powerful things here. <clears throat> you said, um, I get jealous and insecure around other women. I tell myself stories. Mm. I tell myself stories and that I'm not good enough. So basically, it's not about your boyfriend. It's not about other women. It's about the stories you're telling yourself. And the foundational piece of that lie is that I'm not good enough. Jealousy and envy are two things that keep us separated from ourselves. Jealousy is I want what that person has. Envy is, I don't want that person to have what they have. You're operating at a, at, a, at a low temperature jealousy based on insecurity and not being good enough. Now, if you try to uh, express that outward, you do exactly what you say here. You start to be controlling and manipulating. And I see relationships like that, where women or, and men will try to control their mate based on their own jealousy. I saw how you were looking at her. I saw how you were looking at him. Don't do that. You're making me feel making me feel insecurity. Uh, I saw that text where you said this and that to that person. It's not the other person. You've said it here in your writing. It's you. Insecurity based on what? Not being good enough. So you have to serve an apprenticeship to self-love and appreciation. You have to stop you have to obviously go into states of meditation where you observe that tendency in yourself and see the root of it is not good enough so that you can begin to dissect it and disintegrate it. It might be helpful to even use a spiritual practitioner, a spiritual therapist to assist you at looking at those areas in your life so that you can begin to dissect the lie. The lie is you're not good enough. Each and every one of us are, have emerged from the eternal with everything necessary, with joy, happiness, peace, intrinsic to our nature, but it's covered up. There's perhaps experiences, patterns that led to trauma and drama in our life, misbeliefs, who knows who your posse is, who you're running with. Maybe there's a conversation about all men are, and you fill in the blanks, you know, but you can dissect all of that with introspection, going in, seeing those conversations that you said you tell yourself, 
see that it's emanating from a lie. Now, I've taught over the years that a lie believed acts as a law until it's neutralized. So that lie of not being good enough, you believe it, it becomes your law, and it will jump out as controlling and manipulating in a relationship, which would do what? Bring about your worst fear. You'll eventually manipulate and try to control so much that a person may not want to be with you, not because they want to be with someone else, but they may not want to be with somebody that's haranguing them and always on their case about some jealous thing that's in your mind. So don't try to change your boyfriend. Go in and s dissect the lie, serve an apprenticeship to self-love and appreciation. Come to an expanded awareness that you're all right, that there's something magnificent about you, that you're not an accident, that you're an on-purpose, with a purpose, emerging from the eternal. Now, when you feel good about yourself, certain things won't even bother you. Women around your boyfriend, it's not going to bother you because you know who you are. You, you, and, and if you're supposed to be together, you'll be together. You don't have to control him. But it's not going to work if you try to change, change him or keep other women from being in his environment. And this also goes the same for any men who are listening, who are trying to control their girlfriend or keep other men from being friends with your girlfriend. Control and manipulation is not the relationship you want to be in. You want to be in a loving, supportive, free-flowing, energetic relationship based on mutual self-love, self-respect. That begins within. No one can give this to you. You have to do the inner work. Charmaine, do the inner work. Set yourself free so that you and your boyfriend can have really, really good moments without manipulation, control, or blowing up over perceived things that, as you say, are happening in your mind. Have a beautiful day. If you want to, anyone else listening or watching, and you want to shine the spotlight on a question you have, email me at podcast at michaelbeckwith.com and your question may be the one that we deal with that day or it may be the one that I deal with on a solo show where all I do is to the best of my ability answer questions. Have a wonderful day. Blessings. Peace and blessings everyone and welcome back to Take Back Your Mind, a podcast that's dedicated for you to take back your mind so that, so that it becomes an avenue of awareness, an avenue of high choice, no longer hijacked by the world of effects and circumstances, situations, people, places, things, and conditions. You get to take back your mind. So this doesn't just become a rep repetition of mentation, of thoughts that you've had over and over and over again. You can open yourself up to insight and revelation that allows you to become more you. I have a brother, Greg Braden, with me today. We've known each other for a long time. He's been on my radio program. We've been on stages together over the number of years. And today, I get to have him on Take Back Your Mind. Welcome, Brother Greg. Michael, dear Brother Michael, it is so good to be with you. I, I mentioned offline, uh, today is a media day, and I get a list of interviews that I do pretty much back to back. And I saw yours come up today and I've been smiling ear to ear ever since because uh, because you and I have known one another for such a long time. And I know we love our community. We love our family. We love this planet. And we've always done really good work together. So this is unscripted. I have no idea where we're going. I'm going to follow your lead, my brother, in this dance. Absolutely. Well, life is primarily unscripted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. And so uh, before, before I ask you some questions, let me just let people know for the few people who may not know uh, of Greg, and I'm going to have Greg give us his backstory in a moment, but he's the five-time New York Times bestselling author, scientist, and international educator who is renowned as a pioneer in the emerging paradigm based on science, social policy, and human potential. From 1979 to 1991, Greg worked as a problem solver 
during times of crisis for Fortune 500 companies, including Cisco Systems, where he became the first technical operations manager in 1991. He continues problem solving today as his work reveals deep insights into the new human story that we're going to be discussing and how these discoveries inform policies of everyday life and the emerging world. To date, his research has led to 15 film credits and 12 award-winning books now published in over 40 languages. He's actively involved in visionary organizations and think tanks, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Real Science, the Evolutionary Leadership Organization, the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research, and the Arlington Institute. He's presented his discoveries in over 30 countries on six continents and has been invited to speak at the United Nations, Fortune 500 companies, U.S. military, and that's just the beginning. <laughs> Brother Greg... <laughs> Share with us a little bit of your backstory of how of the transition that moved you from where you were in, in, in corporate America, kind of, into this individual that's very science, spirituality, mm. and now embraces the new story. Yeah, you're gonna start with the easy questions first. I, I can see so you <laughs> you know we know we just love to talk about ourselves, right? <laughs> I want people you, to know who you are. I know who you are. I know your books, and my 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 agape nation knows your books because we use them in our wow. classes as well as uh, books of the month and things like that. So thank I, you. I, I I didn't know that. You know, I'm just I'm I'll I'll begin to answer that question with a little story. I was doing a um, a, a radio interview for a morning commute. Uh, radio program, live radio in New York City, not long ago. And the interviewer came on in the morning and he wasn't as kind as you are, Michael. He he didn't uh, he didn't give any kind of an introduction, no bio. He didn't say good morning, welcome or anything like that. The first thing he said, he says, Greg Braden, why can't you stick with one topic like everybody else? He says, man, <laughs> he says, you're all over the map. Are you writing about science, spirituality, magnetic fields of the earth, ancient civilizations, climate change, you know, just stick with one topic. And I, I thought he was kidding at first. And, and then I realized he was. The guy had no sense of humor at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, well, uh, I said, this is a, the 43rd year I have done this work in one form or another. And if you look closely, each of those books goes in depth. It's an in-depth exploration of one facet of our experience, uh, our human experience. I said, so in a very real sense, it is one topic. It's just a really big topic. And yeah. and that was the answer he wanted. He said, okay, let's go to the station break. And he never came back. That was the end of my <laughs> that was the end of my interview. So he never came back? He never came back. That wasn't what he wanted. I, I don't know what it was just one of those every once in a while we get kind of a, a hostile interview, you know, somebody that that wants to, I, I don't even know what they want to do, but, um, and his, what, his, his station, well, his, you didn't give him an opportunity to fight. He didn't I, like, I, I knew that his station, a lot of my fans listened to his station and they wrote into him and uh, really gave him a hard time about the, uh, you know, like the 30 second interview. So, you know, yeah. uh, Michael, when I, when I'm asked this question a lot, people ask how I made what they perceive as a quantum leap. From the world of, I began in academia and the universities and then in, into the corporate world to, to what we're doing now. And, and I think for me, it was less of a leap and more of a, of a logical progression. Yeah. Uh, and I learned a lot in the corporate world. I learned about how people think. During the Cold War years, I was in the defense industry. I learned about fear and how people respond to fear, how people learn, how to communicate uh, with, I, I had to train Air Force cadets on on software and, and how to communicate with people that that may not always want to embrace, you know, what, what it is that you're sharing. And I think for me, the, the bottom line, Michael, I've always believed that if we know where to look and how to look into the past, the wisdom of our ancestors and our most ancient and cherished spiritual uh, traditions, we would find the clues that would help us to transcend the hate that has led to the war and the suffering that we've seen certainly in our lifetimes in the 20th and now the 21st century. And I was part of that industry during the Cold War years, working in the defense industry. And, and that my passion to somehow contribute to, to that piece led me to experience some of the most isolated and remote and beautiful and pristine 
archaeological sites remaining in the world today from the highlands of central China and Tibet and Nepal and India and Bolivia and Peru and through Egypt and Australia and Africa, all through the American desert Southwest. But here's, here's what was happened was unexpected. I thought I was going to explore archaeological mysteries. And the reality was that I had the opportunity to spend time with the indigenous people that live in those places and preserve those <laughs> mysteries. And it was through that human contact and that human interaction that it became very apparent to me as a scientist. I'm, I'm a, a trained a degree geologist with a, a very strong background, life sciences, math, physics, computer science. And, and what I could see is these people didn't have the science, but they understood the connection and the relationship between us and our own bodies right. and our planet and the cosmos and cycles of time, ways that I was never taught when I was in the university and, and the industry didn't realize or, or recognize that. And so, so my passion, uh, I believe that we are living this rare and precious moment mm -hmm. in the history of our planet and the history of civilization when there is an openness, Michael, and, and an acceptance to ideas that we haven't seen in the past. And, and one idea has the potential to take root and to blossom and the fruits of that blossom to direct us into the world that we know is possible in our hearts, but we can create that world in our minds and outpicture that into the world around us. But it's only possible, I think, if we're honest with ourselves about the deep truth of who we are, and what our potential is. And this this is my, my mantra. How can we solve our problems if we're not honest about mm -hmm. what those problems are? And if we're not honest with, with ourselves and who we are? So, so that's a long answer to a short question, but it's, mm -hmm. it helps to understand where it wasn't a separate world right. from the corporations where I am now. It was a stepping stone uh, to help me to, to move into what I'm doing now. And uh, right now, I probably wouldn't make a very good engineer. I, I guess we're consciousness engineers. <laughs> I would make a good consciousness engineer, but uh, <laughs> right. I don't know if I, I'd be a good software engineer anymore or not. I understand exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so, so basically, you're you're saying that it was a it was a a micro movement of evolution in your consciousness that you, well, nothing is really separate. You just became a greater version of yourself based on what you studied and based on the insights that you had. Well, and and you said two things. One, we have to understand the issues we're facing, right. and we then we also have to understand the potential that lies within us, who we really are, and and that and that potential is always bigger than the problem if we're honest with who we are. It's, this is what I picked up from what you're saying. Yeah, yeah precisely. Well, that that was the the path that uh, that led me from sitting in an office in in the corporations behind a computer every day. And it was during that path, and I think what a lot of people are asking is, did I have an experience? Was there a pivotal moment? Uh, and I think there were probably a series of pivotal moments, but one of the most powerful for me was when I, I took myself uh, into Egypt in 1986. It was the first mm -hmm. time that I'd been there, and I, I climbed uh, the top of Sinai at sunset. And I was watching, and if any of you have ever been to Sinai, you know there's nothing there. Uh, nothing grows. There's no trees. Uh, right. There's just you and the earth and the sky and God and the sun and the stars, and that's it. And and I was there alone, and I was watching as the sun dropped below the horizon. And those last rays shot up, you know, over over the rocks. It was just this extraordinary beauty, Michael, that just moved me so deeply. And and. I had a feeling inside my body as I witnessed that beauty. And, and I know myself well enough when that feeling's there, it's, it's a, an opening, it's an intuition mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I can, I can ask deep questions uh, of, of myself and the universe. And, and I asked myself a question I'd never asked before. And, and I, I believe I have a long life. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself in that question, if I didn't, if I left the world in that moment and could never come back, would I feel complete with everything that I had done and everything I'd contributed to the world? And before I even finished the question, the, the answer was welled up this warmth inside my gut. And I was screaming, no, I wouldn't feel complete with what I'd done. And the next question was, what would it take to say yes? Mm -hmm. What would it take for me to say that I've done what I've come to this world to do and that I've loved this world and the people in this world and that I've given what it is that I, I believe I 
I have the potential to offer and to share. And, and the answer to that question became the guidestone for every choice and every decision that I've made since then. And it wasn't long, six months later, I left the corporations uh, at that time and uh, and began a, a path very differently from what I'd been on before. So, so that was a moment right. that stemmed from my choice uh, to, to look into the past and, and to look at the world differently, to think of the world differently than what I was being conditioned to, to do. This is beautiful. So you've had a, a lot of movement in, in ancient civilizations. Uh, you're bridging science and, and spirituality together. And now you're describing, as many of us are, you know, a whole new story that we want to wrap yeah. our attention around. B break that down for us. You know, there is a, a new story that's emerging, Michael. And, you know, uh, our viewers, our family, our community that is is watching us right now, it's no secret that we're living in a time of extremes. We see the extremes all around us, whether we're talking about climate extremes or social extremes or financial extremes or political extremes. And we know that. And, and I think those extremes are important in our lives. We need to talk about them in a kind way so that we can help one another through them. However, mm. for many people, those extremes have become the diversions yeah. from something much deeper. And and I'm, I'm going to use a term and then I'll define it. There is a battle unfolding. It's an ancient battle between good and evil, light and dark. There's a battle unfolding in our world for our thoughts, certainly for our beliefs. We all know that. But there's a battle for our very humanness and the reason is because our humanness is the bridge to our divinity, mm -hmm. and it is actually a bridge to our divinity. And, and when I, I use this recently in live audience, a lot of people link divinity to some religious construct. And right. when we look at, at the, the dictionary definition of divinity, it surprises a lot of people, Michael, and it's a beautiful definition. Divinity is simply defined as the ability to transcend perceived human limitations mm -hmm. not not survive but to become more than the limitations and the limitations may not even be real perceived our perceptions what we have been conditioned to think about ourselves so we we all have a divine nature uh, that's the part of us that's timeless it's ageless it's it's where our deep intuition comes from. I was at the Grammys recently with with my wife. She's on the um, she's a voting member of the Grammys, and we had the opportunity to to be with a lot of the musicians. Not all of them won Grammys, but a lot of musicians there. And I took that opportunity to ask them questions. I said, "Where did that music come from? Mm -hmm. Where did this? Where did the words from that song come from? Or where did that?" magnificent piece of music come from and michael i gotta tell you everyone without exception down to the t everyone said that didn't come from me they said it came through me from something beyond right, right, myself right, right. they said i just had to get out of the way and allow this to flow through me and this this is our divinity it's it's our intuition it's our imagination it's our creativity uh it it, it is our healing and we live in a world michael where the extremes are being used as diversions to keep us in fear, and the yes. fear veils our divinity. And another way of so I'm going to now, now say it another way: the way that you win that battle is is without a fight. You simply become the best version of yourself, and when you become the best version of yourself, and we can talk about what that means. Mm -hmm. When you become the best version of yourself, what that does is it frees you from the bonds and the shackles of the fear that keep you stuck in the smallness uh, of, of life and keep you stuck in, in the feeling that you need something outside of yourself to, to be successful in the world and to be whole and complete within yourself. That's, that's the conditioning. So when we achieve our divinity, we defeat the the we win the battle we defeat that fear because in our divinity we place our sense of well-being within us rather than hinge it on the world around us right and i i think those are big ideas but i think it's important it doesn't diminish the significance 
of all the things happening in the world because we live in that world. However, I think it gives us a new perspective so that we don't get lost in the fear of what a collapsing financial system means right. or what a climate breakdown means or what, right. what social upheaval means. Right. Because, and here's the thing, all of these things, Michael, they're being weaponized. They're important. Yes. And we need to talk about them. We need to talk about the difference between men and women. And we need to talk about the, you know, the rich and the poor. Those are things to talk about in a kind way so that we can find healing. But now they're all being weaponized to polarize us, men against women, blacks against whites, Christians against Muslims, rich against the poor. And, and now it's, you know, the, the whole gender conversation. Yes. Rather than having these, and we all know, I mean, this is not a secret, rather than having these conversations in a kind way yes. to achieve a greater unity, they're being used to divide us and to break the social bonds that, that hold us together as a society. So when we achieve our divinity, when we allow that veil to be lifted and we become the best version of ourselves, we no longer succumb to those fears. We no longer succumb to, uh, to the way that those things are, are being used in our lives. And it frees us to love, Michael. It frees us to love Absolutely. fearlessly ourselves mm -hmm. and one another. And in that way, we win the battle. You know, Buckminster Fuller said this best, and I'm a huge fan. I never met him, and I'm Me a too. huge fan of, of his work. Me too. Absolutely. And, and one of the things, I, I, I saw this in the 80s when I was in the, in the corporations. I read some of his work, and the thing that stuck with me, he said, you will never change the world by fighting against the things you don't like. Right. He said, you, you want a new world? You find a new way that makes the old way obsolete. And then people will follow the new way and the old way collapses. Absolutely. Uh, I think there's a lot, lot of truth to that. So when we live our divinity, what we're doing is we're finding a new way so that our well-being is not determined by the world around us. And uh, and I think that's how we free ourselves, Michael. And I think that's the bottom line to, to what, what's happening in our lives and in our world right now. Absolutely. You, you you said a lot there. I mean, I love that description of divinity going beyond our, our limitations. And the bottom line is love. I, I, I can remember speaking to the congregation during the lockdown and this type of thing, and people were asking wrong questions. You know, they were asking questions like, well, are you vaccinated? And things like this. And I was saying, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's an incorrect question. You don't ask that question. The question that you ask is, first of all, how do you stay healthy? And then And then you ask, you know, how can you stay in love with people that you may not agree with? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the other, the other questions are, are, that's between you and your doctor, you and your soul, but you don't ask people that you can ask how you can ask the question, do you have COVID? But you don't ask other questions. Um, how do you stay in love with people that you may not agree with? So if you ask that question, which is what you're talking about, Greg, yeah then you're not used by the forces that would want us to be polarized to go into hate based on a different uh, a difference of agreement absolutely and, and 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 then you talked about fear you know fear is oftentimes called the the virus of the mind you know because once fear takes hold of you you lose your ability to catch wisdom and guidance and you you can't hear your soul guide you you can't hear the intrinsic uh, love that's within you and so everything that you're saying is, is leading us to something that you talked about in your book, Human by Design. Is that what it's called? From from chance to transformation. Uh, I don't I, you know. I, oh, well, I, I just want to honor. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. And if yeah. anyone's looking for it, here's what happened. The original book was called Human by Design. Uh, Evolution hard... by chance to transformation by choice. Yes. In yes. hardback, when it went into paperback, uh, our publisher made the decision to change that title into something that they believed reflected more uh, the human potential aspect. So they called it the science of empowerment. Personally, uh -huh. I, I think personally, I don't like that title. Uh, I prefer, and I, you know, when you write a book, it, it comes yeah. through and it came through as human by design. And to me, it will always be human by design. But if, if someone's looking for it now, it will be on Amazon as the science of, of empowerment is exactly the yeah. same book. Yeah, they exactly. went with the mass. They went with the mass appeal yeah. aspect of it. But but your title is is absolutely true. But but in there you have science in there about the fact what it means to live with purpose. 
that yeah. that 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 that's extremely important. Break that down for us a little bit. You know, I did a lot of studies on longevity, um, longevity, aging. And, you know, when I talk to people, it's a whole conversation unto itself. When we mm -hmm. talk about longevity, it's not just about living old. Right. Uh, if you're if you are living beyond the, the statistical age of your, you know, your age group, what it means is you're healing along the way and mm -hmm. you're healing at the, at the deepest levels, you're healing at the molecular and the genetic levels. And so I, I did a lot of studies uh, around that. And uh, interestingly, there were common denominators for people that we consider uh, of, of advanced age. My personal experience when I was in one of the last trips I took to Tibet before they closed the borders down, we I can no longer lead groups in, in the Tibet. Mm -hmm. I was with a, a, a nun. Uh, I, I lost my mom during COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom was uh, was a very powerful influence, very powerful force mm -hmm. in my life. She was four feet, 11 inches tall. My mom, <laughs> we, we had the same mom. <laughs> well, she, well, she's come, you know, up about here to me. So when I, I met this young or this, <laughs> this beautiful <laughs> nun in, in Tibet, and she was about the size of my mom. So I was immediately drawn to her. And, and uh, I spent some, the afternoon talking about the history of the, the monastery we were and And our translator said, you know, did you enjoy that conversation? And I said, yeah. I said, you know, she gave me details. I, I don't know how she did it. And he says, well, she should because she's been around a long time. And I said, no, she was telling me about things that happened over 100 years ago. And he says, yeah, how old do you think she is? And I said, I said, I don't know, 80s. He, she was 120 years old when I <laughs> met her. And in a million years, I, I wouldn't have known it. And so I asked her, I said, what, what do you attribute your secret to? And she said, look around me. She said, what would my sisters do without me? She mm. said, who mm. would help them mm. remember all these old traditions? Who would help them cook the meals? Who would help them, uh, you know, with all of the, the challenges that come in their lives? She woke up every morning, Michael, and she felt compelled to get out of that bed because she knew that her community needed her. And that's a powerful, it's not just an emotional and mental motivator. It has a biochemical component. When you feel a sense of, uh, of of being needed and that you are contributing in a meaningful way to uh, to a greater cause, whether it's your family or a nation or a planet. Uh, what happens is that it's it, there's a biochemical series, a series of biochemical reactions that include. Uh, <laughs> I'm hesitating because I don't know how deep to go into this, but you can they, go. <laughs> they they actually they awaken longevity enzymes that we yes. all have in our bodies. Uh, and they trigger the ability to create resilience to change. And it, it all comes through a, a connection between the heart and the brain that is called coherence. Yes. And the, the greater, co there's a little formula, the greater coherence we have between our heart and our brain, the greater the heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is every beat from the boom, boom, and then the peak of one beat to the next, to the next. That time varies by milliseconds. And the greater that variability, the more resilience we have to change. So when we're young, we have tremendous HRV, tremendous heart rate variability and, and resilience to change. Typically, as we get older, we say we lose that resilience. We say we become set in our ways is, is uh -huh. commonly heard. Yes. The good news is you can change this in a heartbeat. And there are intentional. In a heartbeat. He in a heartbeat. <laughs> there are, there are in, intentional exercises to establish that heart-brain coherence. The Institute of Heart Math uh, in your backyard right there in right. California uh, is pioneering that. But even if you don't do those things, it is this sense of uh, of a purpose, the sense of being needed, uh, has this biochemical uh, component in our bodies that is directly linked to not just longevity but to health and to healing. And so that was it was important for me to to see that. And then once I saw that, it wasn't limited to just the nuns in Tibet. Every everyone either that I interviewed personally or that I read their their interviews that were conducted by other people, they all felt a sense of being needed and a sense of contribution. And the oldest recorded woman is a woman in, um, she was in, I believe it was in the mountains of Slovakia. 
uh, mm -hmm. was 132 mm -hmm. years old when she passed. And she, she said the same thing. She said, my family needs me. Who would help my kids with the homework? My grand, I guess it was great, great, great grandchildren, I think is what it was. Uh, 100, 132. And they, in Tibet, they told me they were not the oldest, that there were people much older, but they live in the, in the caves, in the mountains, and they have no papers, no passports. It's hard right. to document them. Right. Uh, but they are very healthy and it's not about clinging to the last shred of life. It's about right. living fully every moment, feeling that feeling of contributing and, and of, of being needed in the world. Yeah, no, that I think that's extremely important. It's one of the, the core messages here. It's like, what if you come to the earth to contribute, not to get, to attain, to grab, to hold on to, or to hoard, right. but what did you come to give? Now, I too had a similar experiences when I was in when I was in Ghana. I met a, a wonderful healer that I worked with. He was only eighty eight at the time, but his dad was one hundred and thirty, um, and and this was a number of years ago. And I think he's still alive. And it was a very similar situation. They felt that they were needed by the community, to because he was a healer and people around the world knew this guy. And when I went to uh, Africa. One of the young boys comes up to me and says, uh, Baba would like to see you. He's waiting. For, you have an appointment. And I said, I don't, I don't have an appointment with anybody. I'm leading a group <laughs> through Africa. You know, he says, no, no, no. We 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 want you to meet. He, he's waiting for you. So I checked around and found out that there really was this healer that they called Baba. And I had no idea who he was. I went to see him. And I was waiting outside of a small room. And I was watching him work with a lady. <clears throat> and the the his apprentice was describing to me what was going on and and translating for me and he was this woman was saying she was looking for her mate her husband and he says well it's difficult for you to get married because you you're you're married to more than one person and and she what do you mean she says well the past relationships you haven't let go so you're still carrying them he says so i'm going to eliminate those your real mate is in your village you see him every day but you can't see him because you're only seeing through the eyes of your past relationships. This guy's translating this to me. Wow. And so I say, I say, we know about that. You know, this is what we do at, at Agape. So anyway, I go in to see him and I had just ruptured my tendon, my uh, playing basketball a few weeks before. And I didn't even know I was going to make the trip. And he starts to speak to me in his language and they're translating and laughing. And he's going, he's laying on his back, he's doing this. And he says, you were playing basketball and you shot the ball five times. I had I made five shots in a row. On the sixth shot, you went up and the, and the tendon busted. And he said, that was a spiritual injury. And he goes to break that down. Anyway, it was a very pivotal time in my life. Um, but his father was 130 something. Wow, wow. So, uh, well, now you can't leave us hanging. So did the woman find her, her soulmate? <laughs> the woman did find the soulmate, and there's some other stories in there as well. Uh, the woman found the soulmate. The, the 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 man took me out to the jungle and had me um, sit and meditate. And this is the 80, 87, 88 year old one, and he's speaking into the forest, and in, in his language. And then a voice answers, and he says English like that, and the voice starts speaking English. We go out and it's a tree that's speaking to us. There's wow. no electronics out here. There's nothing. And this tree gives me a prophecy and then says, I'm going to move out the way and let one of my elder brothers from another forest speak to me. Then another voice came and, and starts to speak and gives me this prophecy. And all the prophecies have come true. And then I, I said, so when we finish, okay, oh, let me back up just a second. As I'm going through the jungle, I'm limping. And I can't see because it's pitch black. Now, the, my African brothers were just walking through the jungle like it's daylight. So after this experience, when I walk back, everything is aglow. I'm seeing through the luminosity of the foliage. Everything is it's like daylight to me. I'd had the same, I had night vision that they had. So I said, to the, I say, well, am I supposed to leave money? And he says, what is a tree going to do with money? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like you lived, you lived Avatar. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's, yeah, so it's what it's. You know, I, when I hear first, I want to thank you for sharing that that story. And but the story uh, was mainly about the fact that these people live to be a long time. That had yeah, purpose. yeah, well, yeah. And and I'm I'm uh, I'm not surprised 
by what I hear, but I'm always in awe yeah. of just the, the deep mystery and how deep our connections with life are and how we're only beginning to understand, you know, in, in our society, in our culture, and how, how much richer our lives would be if we could embrace those, those deep truths, Michael. What, so, What is the reluctance? I think it's fear. It's fear. Story. Yeah. I think it's fear. I, I think there is a fear. So we are conditioned and we, you and I are close to the same age and we are conditioned probably for three or four generations to feel that we are powerless victims yeah. uh, of a world, an external world that we have no control over. And as victims, we need a savior and our savior is being touted as technology. And that uh, conversation is now being kicked into high gear with AI and with computer yeah. chips implanted into the body and, and things like that. Yes. So uh, I think the fear, uh, what our young people are, are being taught to worship the computer chip and, and AI, right. what, they're not, what they're not being taught, Michael, and this is one of the things that, that I share in our, our live programs, is from, a, and this isn't a metaphor, this is... This is real. We, you and I, our biological nature, we are a highly advanced, technologically sophisticated, soft technology. We're not yes. the hard, we're even more advanced. We're not the hard technology of a computer chip or a wire or, or a, a chemical. We are the soft technology of cell membranes and neurons and neurogenesis and ion potentials that move across the cell walls. And here's the beauty is that we self-regulate and we don't even have to know it. We don't even have to know. We self-regulate through thought, feeling, emotion, breath, and focus. And these are the, the access points to this soft technology. So the young people, uh, I was just with a group uh, uh, two weekends ago, and they were telling me about the FDA has just approved computer chips for the human brain that will let you communicate with your keyboard, no wires. Right. And so, so these young, young kids are saying, you know, sweet, I can, do, I can do my gaming with, you know, with no wires and, and no keyboard. I'm just, here's what they're missing. And they were surprised when I said this. Computer chips are definitely efficient. I mean, I'm a high tech guy. I worked on Star Wars during the, the Cold War years and I've seen... Right the most advanced laser systems and communications and radar systems. And I have to say this, Michael, I have yet to see one iota of technology built outside of us that does not mimic something that we already do in the cells of our bodies, except we do it better. We are literally, we're building a world around us that mimics the functions of what we are in here the internet is part of that. AI is part of that. The simulations are part of that because we so long for the deep connection that we've lost, that we're building a, a world around us to remind us of who we are in here. But here's what, here's what the kids mm -hmm. are missing. Here's the part they're missing. Those computer chips, they're definitely fast. They're definitely efficient. They are limited by the physics of the stuff they're made of. The information can only flow in a, a silicon chip between one atom and the, and the next. There's a limit to how fast and how much that chip can do. Here's the thing. What is the limit of the human biology? Those computer chips are not scalable. We are. Every time our body is challenged, our neural networks are challenged, or our immune system is challenged, or our biological networks, our metabolism is challenged, what happens is we adapt and then exceed that challenge. Computer chips cannot be scaled beyond a certain point. The truth is we do not know the upper end of the scalability of a human being. We don't know how far our neural networks can excel. We don't know uh, about how deep the healing that we are capable of, how how deeply we can access that in, in our everyday lives. And we're only beginning to understand, you know, Absolutely. what this is. So they were surprised to hear that because they, they've been taught that the chips are the God, right. you know, the computers are the God. And I said, no, I mean, they're cool. And they're, they are here to serve us 
not to enslave us. And this is this is where we are in a society right now. We're we're at this crossroad. We're making the choice. How much of ourselves will we give away to the technology? Or another way of saying that is, do we love ourselves enough to embrace the deep truth of what it means to be human so that we can achieve our divinity, our humanness, and allow the technology to help us along the way? And, and we're yeah, we're deciding that right now. Yeah. I've said over the years that all that you're describing those are prosthetics of spiritual faculties that are within us. Oh, I love that, man. I love yeah. that. Can and I, can I, can I borrow that? In, absolutely. In a, a program? <laughs> Roll with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm on my way to DC. I leave this week and I'm going to use that on a DC stage this week. Yeah. And so that it's a prosthetics of what's already here. And as you said, we're not looking deep enough within our, within our own being to discover that there's something about us that's infinite. We represent yeah. infinitude in flesh. And um, you mentioned that fear is keeping individuals from actually exploring the depth of their own being. And then obviously there are powers that be which would rather have us in fear. We're more easily controlled when we are in fear and we're more easily controlled if we don't tap into our potential. If we stay in fear, give over our power. I, I, I saw um, something on the Instagram, an interview of a woman who was bragging about the chip she had in her, her wrist. You know, and she was talking, yeah, I can go here and I can swipe this and buy my makeup and buy my food and everything. And and the guy was looking at her kind of incredulous. You know, like, you, could, you put a chip in your body to buy stuff, you know? And she, she felt so good about it. But the the ramifications of that has, hasn't been explored enough. Uh, it hasn't, Michael. And this, you know, this is really being encouraged in some European countries is, is yeah. where it's really taken off. We've got the government uh, and corporations are requiring RFID chips. I, I, saw, I just was requiring watching them. them. Requiring yeah. them. Yeah, they, they require, rather than wear a badge around your neck uh, uh -huh. for security, what they're doing is in the fleshy part between the thumb and the forefinger, mm. Mm. RFIDs. And there was, there was a guy that was proudly uh, bragging about his 34 RFID chips so he didn't have to take his billfold or his credit card. He didn't have to, you know, and it, the marketing is very slick and it's very sexy. And if we don't know who we are, if we are lost in the illusion and the fear, then that technology will help us to feel safe. You know, something uh, I know our time is a little limited and I'm, what I, I, we just covered a lot of ground, Michael. And we did. It's, it's a lot to think about. And what I'd like to do with your permission is share something with uh, with our family, with our community that I use every day that really helps me Please. Uh, to keep keep in perspective what it is that, uh, that that has arrived at our doorstep. And, and this is something I use whether I know I'm going to have a, maybe a difficult phone or Zoom conversation for a business meeting or maybe with uh, an interpersonal relationship or something like that, or just just feeling sometimes overwhelmed um, if I take a peek at what, what's happening in the world. I don't, I don't watch TV uh, and information still comes to me. So, so I think a lot of our friends know I'm, I'm coming to you today from our studio, as I mentioned, just outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm surrounded by indigenous traditions here. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the Northwest of my state of New Mexico uh, is where we find the Navajo nation people call themselves Dine. They don't call themselves Navajo. And in the Dine tradition, one of the things I'm powerfully drawn to is their perspective of beauty. Hmm. Because beauty to them has always been more than a peripheral aesthetic. They hmm. literally say beauty is a for it's the missing force of nature. So, so physicists acknowledge four forces, the magnetic force, the electromag uh, electromagnetic force, gravity, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. And the Navajo say, yeah, those four, beauty is the fifth force. We are literally changed in the presence of beauty. Mm -hmm. our, our, our body chemistry changes in the presence of beauty. And, and to honor that, and just to, to be concise here, they have a, uh, it's a, it's called a beauty prayer. It's very lengthy. Uh, in ceremony, it's good, but on a daily, daily basis, 
one of the Navajo artists has condensed it into three phrases that I've used for probably 30 years uh, on a daily basis. And let me share the phrases and then, and then what they mean. Yes. It's something we say to ourselves, the beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, the beauty upon which I base my life. Mm -hmm. The beauty I live with is an invitation for us to remember that beauty already exists in all things in some, some way. Our job is to seek it out. Our job is to, to find it, to recognize it. And sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes it's not so easy, but as part of God's creation, we have to, to transcend our judgments uh, to, to move to a higher place to find that beauty, the beauty I live with. The beauty that I live by allows us to, invites us to allow beauty to guide us, the expectation that beauty already exists, the expectation that we will find it in every conversation, in, uh, in, in every hurt, in every disappointment, there is a beauty that is there somewhere. And the third one, really powerfully, the beauty upon which I base my life, it's an invitation to bring the, the power of beauty front and center into our lives as a foundation from which we build our perception and our perspective of life rather than a peripheral aesthetic that we experience every once in a while. Mm -hmm. If when beauty becomes the foundation, we are changed in the presence of beauty. And, and one of the, so I, this is something I, I say at least once a day, every, every day in my life. Now what the science is telling us is that choosing to see the world through the lens of beauty literally creates new neural pathways mm -hmm. that begin to see beauty in places where we didn't see it previously. This is the power of the soft technology of, of self-regulation. The, the neural networks begin to develop where we will see past the, the, the fear and we will see past the darkness into the light, into that beauty. And then that becomes our focal point as we blaze through this, this world of, of darkness and light coming together. And, and those neural networks grow only stronger over time. That is the science. What I can say personally is uh, that this perspective has served me tremendously. And it's one of those things where words fail after a while and you just have to, to live it to, to experience it. But what it comes down to, I think, Michael, people are talking about the change in the world. And, you know, a lot of people said, you know, when's the world going to change? And now they're saying, when are the changes going to stop? <laughs> the, the, the point is we're in it. We're, we're in the change. And the only way out of it is to go through it. Yeah. And the question is, do we go through it with a soft landing uh, or do we choose a lot of pain and suffering? And I think the lens of beauty helps us to identify the values that we cherish as individuals, families, communities, and society. And, and this is the thing, Michael, is, is we build this new world. It's not here yet because we're still building it. We must identify the values that we cherish and allow those values to become the foundation, like the beauty is the foundation of yes, everything that yes, we do, yes, yes. so that every law and every policy, every law that's enacted, every policy that's written reflects the things that we value and cherish rather than having them as an afterthought. Right. And I think being able to see the world through this lens of beauty is a powerful tool to identify those values. And, uh, and I do this on a daily basis. So I, I just wanted to share that. No, I think um, it's extremely important. Uh, what, what you're talking about the fact that so many people walk through life with a, a bias towards negativity. Their mind is looking for the next negative shoe to drop, the next bad thing to happen, what they should be afraid of. And they, they're not aware that they're actually creating that as a neural pathway and yeah. then the chemicals to go along with it. It's and the conditioning. We've been conditioned okay. to do this. Yeah. So we have a responsibility and we also have a choice to yeah. recognize that conditioning. It all comes down to love. Do we love ourselves enough yeah. to be the best version of ourselves? And the best version of ourselves does not live 24 seven succumbing to, to the fear. Right. When we understand our divinity, 
then we know that divinity, nothing, nothing can touch that divinity because we we literally rise above the field where that darkness exists. Yes. And we, we still see it and we have a perspective uh, and we still respect it. I have a tremendous respect for for the dark forces because yeah. they exist and and it doesn't uh, it does i don't want to deny that those things are there because that's not honest right but, but honestly uh, i know it's it is a an aspect of our experience it doesn't have to be the focus of our experience and this we go back to buckminster fuller you know we want to create a better world we create a a, a world that makes the old way obsolete and right. i Right. You know, I, I keep thinking about this. You know, war is really on the radar right now because there is a propensity, a push towards war. And I keep thinking, what happens if they throw a war and nobody comes? Right. What if I they mean, throw a war and nobody shows up? And I could see that happening in our lifetimes I because see that's that happening too. Absolutely. That's the that's the better way. I believe in this lifetime, Michael, you and I will live to see the nations of the world will turn their backs on war and walk away because the idea of war, I think, will get really close. To some really really dark dark times yes we will but the yes. the idea of war yeah. is that somebody wins and somebody loses and the war that we have technologically the ability to create now no nobody wins everyone loses yes everyone suffers but but the divinity takes us to a realm that makes war obsolete and right and the power of beauty to elevate us to that i think cannot be understated absolutely and and you you've said a lot. There's so much. I'm gonna have to have you come back, because yeah, I think it's going to be the the rising consciousness of the citizens that don't show up for war. Not necessarily governments or those who are profiting off of war or those who would have us fight each other, but the citizens themselves rising up and yeah. seeing the beauty, seeing the love, seeing the connection that we have with each other, will not show up for the war. One of the beautiful things that happened during the Corona virus, I call it the Corona bonus, is that our youth <laughs> ministry grew leaps and bounds because it became global. People from all over the world were tuning in and our youth got to have beautiful in-depth conversations with youth all around the world, China, Peking, the Middle East, Canada, Australia, and they became one family. They're not going to bomb each other. You know, I'm seeing, Michael, I'm seeing the same, you know, I, I lead yeah. a group in into the Holy Lands uh, yeah. every year. We, we go in December of, of this year and we see the same things. There's a lot of hurt in the Holy yeah. Lands and, and the young kids, the young people, I call them kids. I should call them young adults. Yeah. They recognize that, but they're one generation removed from the original hurt. Yes. And what they say is that was our parents that experienced it. We recognize and we're suffering, but we want more than that. So at, at sunset, for example, you go into the parks and you'll see you'll see Muslim, Christian, Coptic, and Jewish kids drumming at sunset. They're dancing, they're playing music, they're playing soccer, and they got rock bands. They want to participate yeah. in the new world. And I think that's where the hope is in the in the new generation. And and I have talked to service men and women, and honestly, Michael, in a deep conversation, like on an airplane, three hours between cities, they are having a reluctance to hurt another person. They yes. don't want to go yes. hurt another person, at least not, not for the reasons they're being told, because we're not threatened by anything. Right. And and so it's that awake. That's a conscious awakening. It's happening when you say I don't I don't want to go and hurt my right. brother and my sister that I don't even know uh, right. walking on the land of another nation. I'm encouraged by that. And that's that is beauty made manifest. That is the awakening right there. And, and it's a beautiful thing to see it. Absolutely. I, I know this is media day for you and you have to go. I, I, I'm often reminded about when a tragedy happens in the world and armed forces around the world stop what they're doing and go assist. They don't care about the border. They don't care yeah. about the color of the skin. For a moment, they're not soldiers. They're helpers. You know, what if that continued? You know, I love, I love the way you think, brother. And that's why I love, <laughs> I love agape. I love working with you. I, I miss you. It's been a long time since we've connected, but well, I know listen. you're out there and I, I follow your work. And I, I just really appreciate the the community that you have formed around agape and around 
your your very powerful message. I love your work on Sounds True, and uh, I I see that show up uh, all over the world, not just America and places where I go, all through Europe. So thank you. You too, Reverend Greg. You Michael. too, man. Every time I hear something about you, I just have a smile. I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we go we go way back. We got stories we can't even share on the air. So <laughs> absolutely. Well, I'll have you back again. I know you got to do your thing, and uh, absolutely appreciate you. Oh. Before you go, just tell people where they can find you and sure. any, you know, any it's, last, it's, words, any last yeah. words you can say. Just real easy. I am at uh, www.gregbraden.com. It's G-R-E-G-G, -G, two Gs. My mom did that intentionally because two Gs is not a Gregory. One G is short for Gregory. So I'm just a plain old Greg, G-R-E-G-G, Braden.com. And uh, that will tell you where I am and where I'm traveling to. You know, last words, Michael, just thank you for your trust. <clears throat> The truth is, you don't know what, what I'm go going to say. It's always good. <laughs> when when we do these things. And um, I want to thank everyone that's watching just for doing all you're doing to navigate this wild world that's come to our doorstep and for being the best version of yourselves and creating the best world possible. We couldn't ask for any more. Love you all. Thank, thank you, you so much. Those two Gs stand for gracious and great. Oh, I that's love that. I love gracious that. And gracious and great. Greg Brayton. Thank you, brother. Thank, thank you, Michael. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Peace and blessings, everyone. That was uh, my brother, Greg Braden. Uh, look him up. Check out his books. They are magnificent uh, descriptions of reality, science, spirituality coming together. The, the, the divorce that happened many years ago between science and spirituality has been mended by people like Greg Braden and other friends of mine. Have a bright and a beautiful day. Welcome back. If you have watched me over the years at the Agape International Spiritual Center or anywhere that I go to travel and to speak, meditation is primary. Meditation is the foundation of spiritual work, I believe. Meditation is paying undistractable attention to that which is real. Ultimately, those moments of meditation where we're not clouded or caught up in the mind stuff but are aware of it and are embracing it we're not running from it moments in which we have an insight into that which is real and are able to pay attention to it that's a dimension of meditation it's extremely extremely important Greg Braden talked about the fact that we have infinite potential and oftentimes our potential is being subletted out to technology we're making technology a God. We're making AI a God. And we forget that this brain that we have and our soul is bigger and better than any technology that we can create. Who creates the technology? We do. So the technology is subservient to us. But in our society, it's becoming a God. This is what he talked about. So we want to activate our potential. We don't want to run, run, we don't want to run away from it. We want to activate it and it ultimately express it. And so we develop a meditation practice to gain insight into that which is true. So I invite you to place your feet on the ground unless you're in a full lotus position. I invite you to place your hands today in an upward position as a sign of receptivity. Let's have our four thumb and forefinger together as a mudra of as he described, going into our divinity, going beyond limitations of the ego. Close your outer eyes. And imagine for a moment that there's a beam of light emanating from the bottom of your feet, going to the very center of the earth. It's a reminder that we are earthlings and we had the capacity to pick up any transformational knowledge or insight that has ever happened on the earth plane with any human being at any time in human history. It is in the newosphere, the mental atmosphere of the planet. We can catch any truth that has ever been known anywhere by anyone. See that beam of light coming up through your legs, up to the base of the spine, all the way through the spine, hitting all of the chakras, all the way up to the top of your head, and that beam of light going out through the crown chakra, 
into infinity. And you are aware that you are the light, the light that lights up every individual that comes to the planet, that you are a spiritual being, having an earthling incarnation, that you have access to transformational knowledge, creative intelligence, without any process of reasoning and without any experience. So you have access to both knowledge, knowledge has been gained by other humans, and the knowledge that is intrinsic to your soul. See that light emanating from your heart chakra? It's expanding in all directions simultaneously. You are embracing all of the earth, radiating this light as spiritual beings having an earthly incarnation in tune with divine intelligence, wisdom and transformational knowledge gained by human experience and activated by your spiritual awareness. Sit with this for a moment. We're activating our potential. Be still and know the I am God is in the midst of you. And with you as divine light, going beyond all limitations, embracing our heart space big enough to embrace the entire world. We embrace the beauty and the love, the harmony and the peace that's already here within us. And we allow it to magnify itself all over the planet and with every being that we meet. We feel in our being that it is done. Now. And so it is. Amen. Have a beautiful and wonderful day. It's already within you. Set it free. Peace and blessings. sponsor of the podcast. That's the Agape International Spiritual Center. How you support the podcast? You support the sponsor, Agape International Spiritual Center, agapelive.com, or go to Agape International's Facebook page. And if you feel inclined, you feel generous, make a donation to Agape and just say in honor of the podcast, Take Back Your Mind. If you want to support our other sponsor, that is Adapto Zen. That's the creator of my superfood greens, 47 plant based ingredients, energy, digestion, and immunity in a scoop. <laughs> Go to Nutrarise.com, get the bundle, the vitamin D3K2, and the superfood greens. You'll be supporting your body temple and you'll be assisting and sponsoring this podcast. Have a bright and beautiful day. You deserve it. So you might as well receive it. Peace and blessings. Your time is very valuable. So I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. 
Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.